What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. It's 2023. This is episode one for 2023. Super stoked to be back. And uh, today I have Sam, known bad boy. Almost forgot his IG. Sam, known bad boy. Known him for a long time. He's been coming to the Rose Bowl to visit us for years. Um, Seen him at all the different events. Went to his warehouse in San Francisco. He was one of the most successful Depop sellers back in the early days, we get into that. He now is very into collecting Levi's, we get into that. We have great talks about his previous addictions and how he overcame it all. And uh, you know, he gives the listeners a great gift. He says, if anybody out there is dealing with addiction, you can hit him up. Just a great guy, great conversation. It was really fun to have him on the show. Thank you guys for being here. Let's get into it. Sam, aka known bad boy, welcome to the show, dude. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is the first episode of the new year, twenty twenty three, dude. So you're number one. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, we've known each other for a while, but usually it's just through Rose Bowl or through events or through like I came to see you actually not too long ago at your studio in uh, in San Fran, which is in Oakland. 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 Yeah. Don't get it confused. I know. People uh people don't like that, do they? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean San Francisco and Oakland are right next to each other, but uh in terms of like accessibility and like people like claiming their areas, they're kind of far apart. Um but yeah, fair uh, enough. Yeah. Um All right. Well, I want to jump into this. I want you to just kind of give us your your history in this in the video okay. world. How did you get started? And, uh, you know, like, where did it all begin for you? Okay. Um, uh, I'm about to turn 39, but in, like, the vintage years, uh, I guess, like, I've been doing this for seven years. Um, I started I started when I was 31, um, and I was kind of at, like, a crossroads in my life. And uh, I'd, like, been into vintage, like as like a hobby and like wearing vintage clothes for a long time at that point. But I never knew how to make money, uh, doing vintage. Like I would like go to thrift stores and then I would like try to sell the, the clothes at wasteland or something, which is like basically impossible to get ahead doing that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so then like randomly, uh, my, my friend, uh, Asa told me to download, uh, this app called Depop. And I did, and I just started selling stuff that I had laying around in the garage. And um, it kind of started to roll from there. Um, this was like kind of an early time uh, in Depop and kind of like an early time in like the the first big wave of vintage where all these different people were getting together and like starting to like do this. And everyone was like learning stuff together i mean like obviously not what, everyone what year was like that vintage deal oh i don't know uh whatever seven years ago is now <laughs> seven um, years ago you started okay two thousand two thousand fifteen fifteen or 2016 yeah um so yeah not everyone has been like a vintage dealer since the uh the crib like you um <laughs> Yeah, I had that on my notes. I want to talk about that because you're you you actually blew up on Depop, and your name on Depop is called uh, Night Night Court. Court. Night Court. Night Court. Yeah, the infamous Night Court account, um, which is no longer really active, but I have been trying to uh, list a little bit on there, um, 
because it's kind of I don't know. I always will love Depop. Um, uh, Depop gave me the ability early on to like to make money and like to build the entire foundation of my uh, business and my career in vintage. And I will always appreciate uh, the people at Depop that like originally were working there when I was like selling a lot on there. Like I'm sure every single one of them is long gone. Um, but it used to be like a fun place where like people interacted like there actually was like discussion and interaction between people and it wasn't just uh i don't know um but like you know it was like an important time for me and like it's uh, kind of have like n nostalgia built around that um yeah that's awesome man i mean that's kind of a different story than i've heard from a lot of people you know because you you were able to like get on early able to get a ton of followers on there you know and yeah build that up for yourself and you know back in those early days i've always known you for an eclectic mix of product you've been you sell like you know obviously you're really into old levi's and we'll talk about that more later on but but you're also you'll sell a cat shirt or you'll sell like a kitschy grandma sweatshirt or like you'll sell a 70s cool print men's button up like it's there's yeah it just seems like a really cool eclectic mix and obviously speaks to you what were you selling on Depop back in those early days? Like, what was the mix and what was doing well? And, uh, basically anything I could find, you know, that was like during the golden age of like, uh, of like 90s vintage, um, like in popularity, uh, you know, this is when like guest stripe t shirts were huge and anything Tommy yeah. Hilfiger was big. Um, I just, I just went to thrift stores every day and thrifted and I like brought home a trash bag full of clothes and then I would list it all on Depop and I would do the same thing every day. I never took time off. I just listed some every day and shipped every day and like hustled super hard. Um, Cause like I said, like I came from a point in my life where I basically was 31 and I had nothing and I had no money. Um, like I was at a major crossroads and like um, I just, I've always, ever since that time, I've always felt like I was catching up. It's like, I, I, I feel like I just turned into an adult, like, you know, when I started selling vintage. Like, uh, that was the first time I ever really made money, like, first time I ever had responsibility. And so I just worked hard every day. I basically have, like, never really taken time off uh, ever since that started. Um, I work totally different now, but um, my work ethic is generally still the same. Um, I'm out, like, hustling and buying clothes and selling clothes every single day. Um, but yeah, Depop started, it was just, uh, I'm in the Bay Area in California. Um, there are a lot of people into vintage. There's a lot of, like if you go to thrift stores here, there's not a lot of good clothes at the thrift stores and there's a lot of people trying to get them. Um, you know, it's a very saturated yeah, market sure. for sellers. Um, there's not, uh, there's not any easy way to get like cool vintage and get like cool old clothes, uh, from any era here. Um, you have to put in work, you have to have connections, you have to like, you know, you have to like do your thing all the time. Um, but back in the day you could go to a thrift store and it was pretty easy. Um, you would just find stuff and there was like great stuff on the racks for two bucks or five bucks or however much. And, uh, you know, you just took whatever you got and then sold it. And in the early days of Depop, you could just basically sell anything. It was like people had just discovered, like, you can take anything and you can sell it online and people will buy it. You know, people are excited to see your taste. They're excited to see, like, what you find. They're excited to see, uh, like, your selection as a representation of who you are and your experience. And people would, like, this is the early days of people, like, buying into that, you know? And it was great. It was yeah. super fun. Uh, and I made a lot of money. And Depop promoted me a lot. And uh, I, like, you know, took that and I put in the work to to make it uh, go really good. I don't know. <laughs> so give us the, uh, like, in the heyday of the Night Court account, like, what kind of daily or weekly money were you pulling in there? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I feel like... Uh, I mean, like t ten thousand to twenty thousand a month, uh, most of the time. Um, which is like not like huge, not all obviously, but uh, but coming from like, but coming from a place where I wasn't selling like really high grade vintage, I wasn't selling any rare clothes. Like I wasn't, it wasn't like I was finding like 
crazy shit and like making tons of money off it. Like I was just putting in the work every day, hustling the cheap regular stuff that I could find and making like real like adult money from it. And it like it blew my mind. Um, yeah. And for, from what I know about really Depop, like mo <laughs> most items you're selling are like in that $40 range, right? Like max, like. Like oh, 20, not even, dude. Bucks. I was selling stuff for 15, 15, 20, 25, 30 bucks. Yeah. 40 bucks was like yeah. a special item back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So you got to move a lot of product yeah. to do those kind of numbers. <laughs> so kudos, kudos to you, man. You know, obviously you said, yeah. you said already that you're not really on that account right now anymore. You said you're kind of posting again, mm -hmm. but like, give us not how that. like yeah. Depop, Depop changed, you know, like what happened to Depop and like how it changed for you and why don't, why isn't it like it used to be? First off, the main thing is that it used to be like a totally feed-based thing. Like you post an item and everyone who follows you sees it on their feed. And then like uh, slowly it changed into like a search-based thing where like people have to like kind of like go through a lot of stuff to even see what the people they follow are, are posting, you know? Um, just like the way Instagram used to be like, you just saw the shit that people you follow posted and that was it. And there was none of the like, like algorithm, like crazy stuff where there's like ads and reels and all this shit in your face. Like it was just a straightforward thing where like, if you post 20 things in a day, like tons of people are going to see every single thing that you post, you know? And so I would just bombard everybody with, with posting stuff and, <laughs> and try to sell it all, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, it was just like, it was a much more simple thing. It was just straight up like you post stuff and you and people see it and you see the stuff from the people that you follow. Now it's like all these different like search uh, options and all this shit. Like it takes you straight to like, you know, they're like curated things of like cottage core or like whatever shit I don't even understand. Um, and like, you know, it just is it's much, much, much more complicated than it used to be. But it used to be this very straightforward, easy to use thing where like you could post something in like 20 seconds and like and then people would just buy it you know um i feel like every like every app to sell stuff has gotten more complicated it's like you have to it's like selling on ebay like you have to like check 30 boxes you have to do all this different stuff you know um and then like you forgot to check one box and it like you know won't post your item you have to go back and uh you know i used to i really like that in the early days of Depop, it was very easy to use and straightforward, and you just posted your stuff, and that's it. Like, uh, yeah, it, take, it yeah. takes and I would bullshit just... so you get more time to go find stuff instead of worrying about trying to post it. You're right. eBay interface is so yeah. is so bullshit. It's so annoying. Everything yeah. is different. Yeah. You need to it's really annoying. you need to put in so much information. It it like sucks the life out of you, man. Totally sucks the life out of you because. If you can do it easily, then it's not, it's like kind of fun to list stuff and do, and you just get in a rhythm. But like when they make it really difficult, then uh, it makes it much more difficult and much less fun to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I know uh, you don't, we're going to rewind to go into some life shit here. You don't okay. drink alcohol. You don't drink alcohol, right? I don't drink alcohol. I don't do any drugs. Uh, I'm clean and sober for uh, eight years. Um, nice. So yeah, you were I was, so the whole time you've been in vintage, you've been clean and sober. Yes, the whole time. Uh, yeah, I quit smoking. What's, uh, nice. Like, so what spawned that? What 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 was the catalyst that that made you go that way? I was a total disaster. Uh, my whole twenties was basically just uh, like uh, I all ever since I was a teenager, I loved drugs, I loved partying, I loved drinking, I loved all that stuff. Um, and uh in my 20s it was just kind of like fighting addiction issues and like kind of like trying to step back from it and get my life together and then like get deeper into it um i would like i tried going to like community college a bunch of different times like basically to just like keep my mom happy for another six months and you know just like get like i didn't have any long-term vision of what my life was going to be like i didn't have uh like all like all i was worried about was like going to a show or going to a party like this night like i would go to, i would go to shows like you know four to five nights a week i would do drugs basically every single night like um I would, I would sell drugs i would like uh i was very irresponsible i was a very bad influence on the people around me um 
and uh, I was very like unhealthy. I didn't actually end up getting in any like really bad trouble, um, but uh, I definitely caused a lot of wreckage. And um, I like I found myself at like 30, 31 years old with no resume, no work experience, nothing that I can market in any way in like the real world. It's not like I could like go to some uh, like job and be like, you know, like here's what I've done for the past like 12 or 14 years of my life. And like, here's why you should hire me. I just was totally lost. And I feel like, um, you know, I feel like addiction and like addiction issues are very, uh, very closely wound into the vintage world. Obviously, um, you know, most people who are really into vintage are like, have addiction issues. We're all addicted to vintage. We're addicted to clothes. We're addicted to collecting stuff. Uh, we all have like, you know, crazy amounts of stuff, uh, tucked away from like the personal stash or like whatever, like, um, we all fight we all make irresponsible decisions when it comes to collecting. We all like, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of people in vintage that like, they came from a, from a background of addiction uh, in drugs or any number of other things, gambling addiction, like all kinds of stuff. Um, and like, uh, I, 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 was, I was like one of the lucky people that could take my addictive personality and my addictive tendencies and turn that into like a business that is fulfilling to me and where I can make money. And, uh, you know, basically I can like being addicted to drugs is bad. Being addicted to like, like hustling clothing, it can be good, you know? So basically that's, uh, like where I funneled those kind of energies, you know, there's, a, I mean, there's a whole lot more to the story than that. Like, uh, you know, like, yeah, I well, I, I love where it was totally, totally messed up. Um, I was like addicted to heroin and, uh, and, cocaine and all this different shit and i was a total wreck um and then i just uh scraped my life together and started going to aa and um yeah it was uh it was pretty crazy my mom um my mom like knew i had bad addiction issues for a long time um and uh she kind of like stuck by me for a long time and like waited it out and she has lots of friends and people she knows that had children that um were in a similar situation and you know they're still like on the streets doing drugs or they're dead and uh like I feel very lucky to uh have escaped all that and uh now I'm a very like good productive uh American citizen tax paying citizen <laughs> yeah thank yeah, you for mostly, thanks yeah. for uh, thanks for opening up about that um, I think I think you're very, you're very correct. A lot of people, you know, they move addictions from something else into this world, um, which, like you said, can yeah. can can be very productive. You got to replace those addictions. You know, um, I've yeah. talked to a lot of different people. Like, yeah. uh, you know, like we we get that same dopamine. We get we get the excitement, the uh, fulfilling. Like when you're out sure. on a dig, when you're out hunting, like you get you know you get dopamine firing in your brain from finding that cool piece or getting sure. a come up or seeing something you've never yeah. seen before. And that's similar to that same feeling that you're trying to replace with, um, the drugs or alcohol. It's totally the same. It's totally so the same. When, and when it, uh, same kind of is, hold on. It's the same kind of, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, it's the same kind of like, uh, downward slope too, where like the first time you find something crazy, like it feels so good. And then, like, you know, like, you want it, you're, like, you're chasing that first high of, like, finding something crazy every time, you know? And then, like, eventually, you're kind of just, like, like, spending thousands of dollars on clothes, like, trying to, like, chase this feeling that kind of, like, won't exactly come back in the same way, you know? Like, you know how much stuff I've spent thousands of dollars on that just goes in, like, a cardboard box? And it's, like... You know, I know, I know you have a crazy like hoard of clothes. It's all just put away in bins and you pull it out and you look yeah, at it yeah. and it's like, um, that's it, you know, like the, but like the entire process is trying to chase that, like that first feeling you felt that felt good. You know, it's just the same thing as doing drugs in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, <laughs> it is. It's tricky. And then like, you've seen more things. So the same thing doesn't give you the high anymore. Just like you need, you need a bigger hit of the drug to get the same true. feeling. And then you're like, where do you, you get that same hit, yeah. thing? You need a bigger hit. And then the bigger hit is like yeah. something older or something more rare. And it's harder to find. It's yeah. fucking harder to find. So it's like, that's a, it's, it's a good point to bring up, you know? 
I guess uh, yeah. Yeah. no matter what addiction <laughs> you have, you still got to monitor it. You still got to learn to deal with it because, you, you know, you're not going to go out and spend a hundred grand on a pair of jeans all the time. That's for damn sure. No, dude. <laughs> so I wanted to ask about kind of more the nitty gritty of like kicking addiction. We can just touch on this quickly, but okay. You know, there's like people, a lot, of, I, I believe like there's a lot of alcoholics in our society. Like more people are alcoholic than want to admit it. And, you know, obviously there's lots of people who do, yeah. do other drugs too. Um, and there's functioning people as well who can do all that and still function and run businesses and whatever. But like the actual act of yeah. kicking, kicking when you like, when you had that realization, when you were like, okay, I'm going to go sober, I'm going to go to AA. Do you remember, I mean, it's a long time ago for you, but do you remember like how that went for like the first few months and like how hard it was and like the things you're dealing with during that period? Yeah. Um, the really hard part is like reaching the point in your life where, uh, like you're, I mean, you're obviously like afraid of changing, you know, everyone who does drugs or is like a, uh, like, like really bad alcoholic. It's like, you know, there's a problem. Like, like everyone who does like heroin, uh, they always are planning on kicking like the next day, you know? And then every single day it's the next day and it never, it's like tomorrow never comes, you know? And it's like, um, but once you actually get to a point where like the decision has been made, like for me, like once, once it became a reality that like, I just like, I couldn't do it anymore. The actual process of like not doing drugs, uh, again, was not that hard. Um, the really hard part is like, is trying to clean up like the emotional, uh, wreckage that in yourself and, uh, in like the world around you that you've caused, um, the really hard part is getting to the point where you actually accept, like, like I'm not going to do this anymore, and I'm not going to do it anymore from this moment right now. Because um, it's, like, it's really hard, you know? Like, you can have all these different plans for the future or visions of what the future is going to look like, but just getting to the point where you actually do it is, like, is the hardest, is the hardest thing in the world to get to. Um, yeah. Because you're always, you're always... Um... Yeah, like it's uh, it it's it's tricky to make that commitment, and then and then because you're you're always living in the in the world of I'm gonna kick it soon, I'm gonna kick it soon, so it, it's an excuse yeah. to keep going, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like you're like tr you have a tremendous uh physical addiction, and you have a tremendous mental addiction to whatever it is you're doing, um, you know. And it's like once it gets to the point where it has like engulfed your entire life, it's like uh. It's totally inescapable, you know? It's in every single thing that you do, uh, in every decision you make, and every single part of your life. Well, uh, kudos to you, man, for being where, you know, getting through it and being where you are now. It's awesome. I think talking about this stuff helps a lot of people, you know, and other a lot of people are could be in the same situation that need to make some changes. Yeah. Uh, if, if anyone is listening to this and you have uh, any kind of an addiction issue or... Uh, even if you're addicted to clothing or anything, uh, feel free to reach out to me and, uh, I'm happy to try to help in, in any way I can. Um, you know, like I, I feel, I feel very, very lucky to be at this point in my life. And there was a, there was a very slim chance that I would make it here from where I was. And I'm lucky enough that I did. Um, so if anyone has ed like any kind of question from like the very first thought of like, I might have an issue. Or like to like being at the very like depths of addiction. Uh, feel free to message me uh, anytime. Yeah, and you know his Instagram's right on the screen here. So hit him up. That's a, that's a big offer. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, of course. So let's move back into the vintage scene. Uh, I want to talk about San Francisco. So okay, you know, give us your take. You, you obviously talked about the thrift stores already. That it's you know, I'm I'm pretty sure the thing that you described of thrift stores being kind of dead in your area is happening all across America. It's happening all across Canada. It's pretty common now. Every city, every major city is pretty beat up, right? For yeah. the average like thrift shop. But, um, you know, give us the deeper take on, on Oakland, San Francisco, like what's the scene like, you know, um, the scene is, give us, uh, the scene is, is pretty good. Um, you know, uh, 
I don't know. Um, it's much smaller than like, uh, you know, like there's also LA in California and like the scene in the Bay Area has got to be, you know, like 10 to 100 times smaller than LA. Um, there's no rag houses here. Uh, there's mostly just thrift stores and uh, I think like two bins um, in the Bay Area. Uh, tons and tons of people packed in kind of like a small um, area. Uh, there's there's a lot of good clothes to be found here. Um, you just have to put in the work to find it. Um, you know, I feel like the Bay Area scene is like pretty pretty similar to the scene in most places, you know? Like we followed all the same trends as other places where, you know, it was like 90s stuff and, uh, you know, then like, like big print cartoon t-shirts and like all the different stuff and like everyone, you know, and then everyone kind of switched to true vintage all at the same time. And, um, you know, like, uh, the Bay Area is like a place where, um, people are open to like, to wearing vintage and like wearing used clothes. And like, there's a good, like general, um, like community and market for that here. Um, yeah. You know, San Francisco is like a very eclectic city. Um, it's one of the coolest cities like in the world. Uh, it's beautiful. Um, it's also like really, really expensive uh, and like dirty and there's grimy ass people. Um, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, you know, it's like there, there are people paying like 1200 bucks to rent like a closet to sleep in, you know? And like, um, like, so I have this, I have this like theory about, um, about like clothing and like used clothing and how, uh, it gets like disseminated into the community and stuff. And I feel like an important thing is like how valuable property is. Um, if you're in a place where there's like really, really valuable property, um, then there's going to be like kind of like less old clothing turning up because there's such a like if 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 property is so valuable that like there's this huge incentive for it to always be rented out or always be used then it's like you know you're not going to like open up some building and like find like just a stash of clothing sitting there since the 1940s you know it's like yeah when like when a when a place when someone moves out of a place it's like they call in the people and they dump everything in the trash and uh you know it's like um there's a lot more stuff, you know, there's a lot of estate sales and that kind of stuff too. But, um, there's also, uh, the Bay area is not a great place for, for like true vintage and like really, really old stuff to turn up. Um, whereas like in the Midwest, you can like much more easily find stuff from like the twenties and thirties and forties, you know? Um, so like if you're, if you're here, like hustling clothing and doing vintage, like finding stuff from like the forties and fifties is pretty rare. Um, I mean, it's definitely out there, but Usually yeah. we find like solid like seventies, eighties, nineties vintage, um, you know, and that's what that's what most of the market is too. Um, I want to talk about this theory you have about you know, property value for a second. This is a cool. Okay. This is a right, cool theory because uh, uh, this is not this is not perfectly worked out in my mind. So um, this makes sense try. though because <laughs> what you're saying is that in a place where things have to get rented out, like there's a higher turnover of property all the yeah. time, right? Cause people are flipping and making money, yeah. meaning these houses are, and buildings are getting cleared out. Shit's like either going to the to thrifts or whatever. So yeah, at some point, or don't the the shit, the sh most stuff just goes to the dump, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I've been, I've been to estate sales where like they've been cleaning out hoarder houses for like two weeks before the estate sale. And they've mm -hmm. already said they've taken like four dumpsters out of there, right? And you know anything really no. good or old or or workwear has gone into in the there. dumpster. It's yeah. All in there. Yeah. So, you know, maybe that's a good strategy for, for travel picking is to look up the lowest property value spots and go to these places because <laughs> I don't know. It's it's a good theory. Well, there's like in the Midwest, you know, it's like there's like uh you know, there's big properties, uh, there's like big areas with not a lot of people. And it's like, you know, there's like a barn on the property and it gets filled up with stuff. It gets filled up with clothes and junk and old things. And then once it's full, they just build another barn and start filling that up with other stuff. You know, it's like, um, but out here it's like every square inch is so valuable that like, it's more rare to find like the hoarder stashes or all that kind of stuff. It's definitely out here. 
but you know if you hit like a, if you find like a hoarder house here it's probably going to be like 80s and 70s and 80s stuff or 80s and 90s stuff um it's not going to be like some crazy stash of like you know like 40s workwear and like all that shit that like turns up in in other places you know you're not going to find some stifle overalls laying on the laying in the attic or something you know like that it, yeah. it just basically doesn't happen here you know um totally so yeah I, I feel like yeah i feel like the the way that the way that the property is used in an area tremendously affects uh the, like how what vintage is here and what uh like clothing turns up and like makes its way out to the like vintage community and market um yeah for sure i think i think you're totally right on that you know it, store storage is expensive so if someone's going to store something for a long time you know that storage has to be hella cheap for someone just to sit on something like a dead stock hall or empty store because every month you're like adding cost to that stuff you know sometimes i think about storage and you're like by the time you're done with storage, after like five years, you're like, the value of your shit in your storage better be worth like hundreds of thousands of dollars because you've just put yeah. like so much money into keeping it for so long. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it could be, it could become totally worthless in the long run, you know, unless it's like really good stuff and it appreciates at like the same rate that you're paying rent on the storage. But that's like, that's not uh, likely, you know? No, um, exactly. But yeah, like. Yeah, the cost of the cost of keeping all the stuff that we own is really expensive for the most part. Um, yeah. So San Francisco, Oakland, obviously, like you said, that people don't like to, to you know, if you're from Oakland, you're from Oakland. And I do know that because I've I've been there a bunch. I have friends, like even high school buddies from Oakland. So I spent some time there back in the day. I used to yeah. go to San Francisco more. You know, I've yeah. I hung out in like, um, uh, you know, to me, it seemed like Hate Nashbury was like the vintage kind of like Melrosey Street back in the day. I don't know if that's still a vibe. Yeah. You know, Berkeley uh, was kind of like hippie, hippie vibes back then. And I remember like, you know, I don't know if that's still a thing. Like Berkeley's kind of right beside Oakland, right? But it's still like, it's like a yes. more wealthy side of it, obviously. So give us like, you know, beyond the vintage yeah. scene, like the whole like uh, the different kind of vibes of your area. Uh, I don't know. Um, I kind of have. I kind of don't even have that good of a uh, have a grasp on it because all I do is work basically, and then uh, I come home and like you know watch a couple of TV shows and eat dinner and go to bed and then get up and work more. Um, I'm not like uh, I don't do that much social stuff or that much stuff in the community. Um, you know, Oakland is a super cool city. Uh, there's a lot of the cool thing about the Bay Area is like. There are a lot of really good people here, a lot of forward thinking people here. There are people that care about their community and they care about the world uh, in San Francisco, in Oakland, in Berkeley, um, all around here, you know? Um, there's kind of like a general feeling in the area that like, that people want what's best for the people around them and for the world in general. Um, and I don't, I don't exactly get that feeling in a lot of places where, you know, the where the more popular thinking is like, you know, like everyone just looks out for themselves and that's kind of it. Um, so there is like a good feeling of community here and a good, um, uh, like sense of place. Um, but it is, it is really expensive here. Um, and it's not exactly, uh, if you're going to do vintage, it's not the best place to live. Um, because you're going to be paying a lot to live and to store your stuff and, uh, you know, and like the payoff in, the stuff you find is not exactly there. Um, but it is a great place to live. It's a great, um, first off, uh, the East Bay has the best weather in the entire world, in my opinion. Um, it's always temperate. It's never like, it's almost never freezing cold. It's almost never burning hot. Um, basically like nine to 10 months out of the year, it's like 70 degrees and like perfect weather. Um, so that's really the best thing that we have going for us. Uh, you know, like, cool. Um, yeah. Bill's told me that you're into Bay Area rap. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, okay. Let's. Um, we should take this back to. Uh, I grew up in Napa, California. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, Napa was not the best place to grow up. It is bougie, and then, uh, 
there's kind of like this like rich upper class in Napa and the rich upper class in Napa only exists because there's like this poor working class that gets like taken advantage of, um, which would be like, you know, like winery and food service industry. And then like the people that actually run it uh, and like work it either like, you know, it's like Napa might be too expensive for them to live there. So they drive in from uh, other places like American Canyon or Vallejo or like um, other places far away. Um, there's a lot of like, uh, basically everyone in Napa uh, is uh, involved in the wine industry or the food service industry in some way. Um, and it's not, uh, to me, it's not a very appealing thing. Um, yeah. And it was not a really fun place to grow up. Uh, I grew up, um, yeah, I, we grew up, uh, all, me and all my friends grew up like idolizing Bay Area rap music. Um, I really love uh, 90s Vallejo rap. Um, you know, this all like, uh... <laughs> yeah, like we've- So grown... who's, who's Vallejo rap? Like what groups are from that area? I mean, E-40, Mac Dre. Um, Mac Dre uh, was on a record label uh, called Young Black Brother Records. And basically anything from that label in the 90s is really, really good. Um, you know, like, t to be honest, like, uh, like after the 2000s, like I kind of, um, like when I grew up, all we listened to was Bay Area rap. All we, like, we, there also was like this thing where like, you weren't even supposed to listen to like rap from the East coast. Like we still were stuck in this like mentality of like East versus West or whatever, but it was even more like localized than that, where it was like, you only listen to Bay Area rap. You know, or like, you know, some stuff from the South or like whatever, like, um, but it was like, with all the people here, it was like, really kind of like driven into us that like, you just listen to like, the local rap. And um, yeah, it was kind of like, it was cool, because I really do love that music. But it also um, meant that I didn't discover a lot of uh, the music that's now very important to me. Like I didn't discover it until my 20s or my 30s. Um, and so I had this very, uh, like, shut off, uh, like, view of music. Um, and then that all kind of expanded in this really big way later on in my life. Um, that's uh, awesome. So what what are you into now? What's What music are you referring to that's very important to you? Um, well, basically, like, almost only, like, like British or UK music. Um, uh I don't know, like there's like lots of music that was totally mainstream uh, from the 80s and 90s in the UK that is like, you know, some of the best music ever made, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, so uh, also, uh, we should tie this into uh, I collect t-shirts, I collect band t-shirts. Um, uh, I have a pretty crazy collection of Stone Roses t-shirts, uh, Primal Scream t-shirts, Happy Mondays t-shirts. Uh, Jesus and Mary Chain, uh, all kinds of other Britpop and shoegaze stuff. Um, yeah, uh, this is like another nice. uh, collector mentality thing where like the goal is to get every single good thing and like hoard it all for myself. And, uh, you know, like I don't even wear most of them, um, but uh, it's just. And then what? What's, what, what, get everything. what's after? What's after hoarding it all? What, what do we do with it all when we're done? I don't know. I, I don't even want to think about that. Uh, we just, uh, <laughs> don't, you know, collecting it is like the fun part, you know, it's like, um, it's cool to like get all the things that you want and the things that you like. And, uh, you know, but also it's fun to have stuff still out there that you want that you've never gotten, uh, because that like, it still gives you something to chase, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. For like those band t-shirts, like, I feel like I have probably one of the best collections in the states um but like there's like crazy like one-off uh stuff like t-shirts made for like single concerts and stuff that uh that i've never seen don't even know they exist and i will never even have a chance to get them um you know uh but it's fun to try it's fun to like it's fun to hunt the stuff down and it's fun uh you know it's fun to pull it all out and look at it and uh you know sometimes you like pull out your own collection of stuff and it's just like shocking how much cool stuff you've accumulated you know it's really fun yeah, and when you get to a point of collecting, 
you get so much shit that w- when you go through it, you're like, wow, I forgot about this one, or I forgot I had that one. That one's yeah. sick, you know? And like, it, it, it gains esteem over time. So it is kind of good to put your shit away and not look at it for a period of time because then it gets it's you definitely good. To it's definitely good to put your shit away. Um, you know, uh, I have this theory. Uh, like one of the few things that I've discovered in vintage or like one of my like realizations about, um, you know, it's like if you if you do vintage and like you work really hard at it, like and you develop your taste, like you probably have good taste. You probably uh, like come you probably come in contact with a lot of stuff that you really like that maybe other people don't know about or don't see or don't recognize the value and like just be true to yourself if you have something that you think is really cool and it's not worth anything put it in a box you never know like you it might in five years you might pull it out and it might be worth a ton of money and like it might like there's a lot of stuff that that like everyone has been into and like saw as a cool thing and like then it gained a ton of value like overnight you know like i remember when I first started, like when I first started getting into uh, like collecting t-shirts and stuff, I would collect art tees. You know, I would like, I would go to the flea market and art tees would be 10 bucks, 20 bucks, maybe 30 bucks. And it's like, I would buy every cool art tee I would see. And like, and then I would, I would sell them too. I would sell them for 30 bucks or 40 bucks or 50 bucks. And like, but I put a lot of cool ones away, you know? And then like, it seemed like the vintage community discovered RTs overnight and it's like everything was like 100 to 200 bucks right away um and it's like uh i wish i would have saved a whole lot of those cool ones you know <laughs> um but like yeah but i have like i have all this stuff saved that is just like random stuff that i think is cool and like my thought process is like if you think it's cooler than it is valuable put it away because the other people and the other people's taste and the market value will probably catch up to your vision of it at some point in the future. You know, if it feels special to you, don't sell it for 30 bucks. Just keep it and put it away because like, it's always going to be, it's probably always going to be cool and special to you. Sometimes you pull out a thing that you have stashed away and you're like, oh, I don't even like this anymore. And you just sell it like whatever. But like, yeah, the, uh, the, if you're really into something like dude, just, just tuck it away and uh you'll almost always I have a couple honest. points to add to that. Okay. You know, like what you're saying is super valid and and uh I mean one side of that is that you can also if if you like something and you're like this is not something that's valuable in the market but you see the value in it, you see the style in it, it just resonates with you. There is other yeah. people out there in the world that probably feel the same way, but you might just not have them as a customer yet, right? So Right. You can also like develop that customer base for something that you're like, this should be my shit. I'm gonna make this my shit and I'm gonna find the people to that are that like my shit. You know, just yeah. kinda like you have an eclectic mix and you got people that buy cat shirts pretty consistently. Someone yeah. else might not, you know, and yeah. like you gotta develop that in your own business. Um so I I think it's it's yeah, like stay true to your heart and kinda like kinda work with that and um and that's why also the vintage pricing game is so crazy because it's like we see prices based on the prices of everyone's stock comes from their own brain, right? So right. it's like right. there's like market values to certain things, but certain things right. there isn't. Like there's a lot of things that are just like folk art or artistic pieces that you're like, there's no value to that because it's just no one's seen it. It's not it's not common enough to have like a benchmark. Right. And it always comes from up here or something's nostalgic hit or like attachment to something drives one person's price up here and the other person doesn't give a shit about it and it's down here. Totally. That's why there's never going to be a standard and that's what you have to understand as like a customer of vintage is that you're basically paying for the value it means to somebody. For sure. No, that's totally true. Um, That's totally true. And like, uh, you know, like there's, I mean, obviously like all of collecting and like being in vintage is all tied in with nostalgia and like uh, you know, like the reason we like old clothes is like either like you're just looking for like the best made thing, like this really high quality thing. Like you want, if you're an old device, like you want the best pair of jeans ever made or something like that. Um, but really like the main reason I like clothing is because it's like, it's our connection to the past. You know, it's like, um, you know, clothing is kind of like the way that I look at history and like, I look at like all 
of like uh, like our experiences and stuff you know it's like when you watch like uh like old like you like look at some like photo of like like a war photo it's like you're looking at the jacket they're wearing you know you look at all this shit you know you look at a picture from the 60s it's like you're looking like oh is he wearing like 501s or 505s or like you know it's like it's like we all are trying to like dissect this stuff you know and um it's like you know clothing what clothing does for us is like you like you pick your clothing based on like what you like and like who you want to be and how you want to look and then like wearing that clothing helps like shape who you are and it shapes your experience and like the things and like it it, it, like shapes the way that you act like you know clothing gives you the feeling and it's like it's like every day like you're trying to like you're trying to like create the person you are based on the choices you make uh of the clothing you wear or the things you surround yourself with in your life you know and it's like i heard i heard something recently uh fashion is political okay that statement that quote i don't know who who it was but it was i heard it on another podcast right so when you think about fashion as political, you're like, okay, what does that mean? It means like what we wear is making a statement to the world, right? It's definitely so like true. Big trends in fashion, like like when you go back, like hippie culture, they're like they're like saying like fuck the fuck the suits and ties and shirts that everyone's wearing to go to work. Yeah. We're gonna wear like ratty old thrift store shit and leather and fringe and and go rock out, you know, and yeah. like live free or like um, <laughs> so political. Yeah. It's a political statement, whether you like it or not. You're saying something to the world about who you are, what you believe, for sure, and what you want to put out there. That gets that gets convoluted and weird now because we're in this we're in this cross section of time when <laughs> there's a thousand trends at once, right? So some yeah. people could just be like, "I like the way that looks." I don't know what the political message is, but in, in reality, trends are created because people want to make a political statement. Quick intermission to the podcast. For a word from our sponsor, F is in Frank, vintage.com, right here. You guys, my listeners, I appreciate you all so, so much. And because of that, I'm giving you 30% off to the website. Code VTG and stuff gets you 30% off to F is in Frank, vintage.com. If you like this podcast, if you learn something, if you're looking for a way to support me without just giving me money, you can buy something from F is in Frank, vintage.com. And get 30% off. It supports the show. It supports me. So thank you. Appreciate it. And keeps me able to keep doing these episodes. Now back to the episode. Yeah, okay. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna switch topics here. We're gonna we're gonna do the, the quiz, okay? And then after this quiz, I wanna get into your love of of Levi's, the okay. the, the the quintessential vintage item that kind of started the whole business. But let's, okay. do the, let's do the quiz first, okay? All right. Okay, so I got five questions. What que- what town was Champion Brand brand from? Oh, man, I don't even know. Uh, I'm, I'm ignorant to a lot of uh, vintage history, so I don't know where Champion is from. Oh, wait, uh, wait, is it from New York? It's from New York, yeah. Is it, is it like Rochester, New York? Yeah. Boom, see, you know, more oh, okay. you, you know more than you know. I just seen it on. I feel like I've seen it on tags of like newly made shit. So for sure. Um, okay. And, and, all right. That's what's on old ones. Okay. So you, and you're one for one. <laughs> all right. I got lucky there. Um, what does the tri- okay. what does the term tribeland refer to? Tribeland. Oh, uh, cotton poly rail. Boom. Two for two. <laughs> okay. Right. So for those that don't know that that is <laughs> tribeland is like a type of t-shirt from the eighties that that they used the three <laughs> fabrics instead of. Just the regular poly cotton. I don't know if those are still hidden, but they had a moment where they were hitting hard. I like them. I think they're comfortable. Uh, also, the sweatshirts are good too. There's tribe sweatshirts too. Yeah, and they're always that heather gray, like that. Uh... They're always that heather gray. Yeah, I like them. Okay, yeah. next question. Okay. You're two right. for two. What was the brand name <laughs> for one of the earliest versions of a zipper the way we know it today? This question's kind of tricky. Wizard. it? That's, Wiz it. That's one. I thought not what I have here. I'm going for something else. Uh, early brand name is Zipper. Uh, it's like because I, I don't before know. the Zipper, before the Zipper as we know it, there was other versions of Zippers, but they were like different. They were invented differently, and once they finally came up with the Zipper as we know it, it <laughs> there was like one that we look for as vintage dealers. Uh, 
Damn, I don't know. I'm blanking on. Okay, it. it's we. Uh, I was. I was. I put hookless. Oh, hookless. Okay. The hookless okay, fastener. Okay. Cause I, I was. Oh yeah, hookless fastener. Okay. I could, All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you're right. I could be off on my history uh, exactly. But... No, no, no. You no, you're right. Um, but I, I feel like when when the zipper was invented, uh, there was like a national uh contest um to name the zipper, and I think the winner of the contest uh named it the the Wizard. Oh, um, and so there's like there's early things uh called the 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 Wizard, uh, and then it got renamed the zipper after that. Um, yeah. But I could be wrong about that. Too. No, I, I, I have a really, I have a really bad memory. They were all hit, uh, you know, the hookless fastener before I think it was even yeah, called yeah. the zipper, and that was like because before that, the, the zippers actually did have hooks, and it would like hook in weirdly. So there was like these other versions mm -hmm. of zippers that they never continued with because they once they came out with the hookless, it was better. Anyway, yeah, I guess I, I always just thought of that as like the hookless zipper, but I guess uh, no, you're you're totally right. Um, all right, I'm, that was, I, that was, I didn't get that, that one. That was a tricky one. <laughs> and uh, okay, so this is uh, okay. That you're two for three. Let's go for question four. Two for three. What brand right. was the first to supposedly ever manufacture the sweatshirt? Oh, oh man. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, is it? It's not champion. I already asked you a champion question, so maybe we'll uh, rule right. champion out. All right, we'll go with uh, Wilson. It was apparently Russell. Russell. Yeah. Okay. It was apparently right. Russell because his kid was like, do. his kid. They 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 made like regular men's formal clothing. I mean, everything back then was like formalish clothing, right? Yeah, yeah. And then eventually, yeah. I think his son was like a football player, and he was like, "I need to make something for my kid." And then they started yeah. playing around with cottons and made the sweatshirt. And obviously, that okay. that history is kind of arguable because. Yeah, yeah. All the historians want to be like, no, Champion did it first. No, this did it first. Blah, blah, blah. But, yeah. but apparently Russell claims they were the first in like 1908 or something. The first to make the cotton sweatshirt. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay, let's go. Okay, next one. Last question on this quiz, and then we'll, we'll get into something else. So what year did Levi's first make jeans? Uh, I mean, the mo like the first riveted jeans is, is 1873. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know, like arguably you could say that jeans were being made before that, but what we know as like the modern, uh, like riveted blue jeans was 1873. That's when the, yeah. then when they got patented. All right. Yeah. That's what I got. Okay. Here. All right. Um, okay. Sick. Okay. Three, <laughs> two or three for five. Good. Good. All right. Good percentage. All right. That's like a, All right. it's like a it's still like a D, right. still a D though. <laughs> Um, okay, so on that note, on the Levi's note, let's talk about your obsession with uh, the brand and with the pants and with denim. <clears throat> How that all started? When did you um, start learning about that? To, uh, okay, well, funny story. My first ever job actually um, was working for the Levi's outlet in in Napa, um, and I got <laughs> I didn't love Levi's in any way. Uh, I didn't care about it. I just went and apl I applied to every store at the outlets. Um, and Levi's hired me because, like, I wrote some, like, some bullshit. Um, and then I got fired for stealing. Um, so I'm probably, like, on a blacklist from ever working uh, at Levi's. Um, but anyway, then, like, way down the line, uh, when I was in my, uh, like, early, uh, like, late teens, early 20s, um, you know, I, I actually had, like, a similar path uh, of getting into clothing that a lot of people did. Um, uh, I got into Supreme. I got into like, uh, like this is like the golden era of Nike SB when they actually had like tons of creative people making amazing stuff. Um, and so like I was into like this world of sneakers and t-shirts and whatever. And like, you know, a natural part of that is like, you want to have like nice jeans, uh, to like match your outfit. And so I got into, um, LVC Levi's, you know? And like, I like, you know, like bought the LVCs. I looked at the little like booklet of like, here's the different years and the different like versions of uh, of Levi's all throughout the years. And like, um, even though a lot of that information is actually wrong, obviously. Um, but like, that was my initial thing was just like, I want to have some nice jeans. And like, Are I want to have nice out, jeans. You're calling out Levi's saying that their little booklet was off on the dates and shit? The little booklet is, is off on a lot of stuff. There's like... Uh, you know, um, they kind of generalized a lot of stuff and a lot of the like 
a lot of the like cuts of like the different genes are like totally uh like inaccurate for how they really are but like i, I we should maybe even cut that out because i think levi's is great and lvc is great no and, it's uh... whatever <laughs> They're probably right. Um, they, they probably purposely modernized certain things to make them more appealing yeah. to like the modern customer. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there, yeah, there definitely were like uh, subtle and non-subtle alterations to uh, the history to make it uh, more of an appealing thing, you know. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. So getting into Levi's started like very unceremoniously as just like I wanted nice jeans to, to be a part of my outfit, um, and then I kind of just got into it and like uh you know and then it's like oh instead of having lvcs like i can i can like try to find a nice pair of red lines you know and um and then it all my whole entire thing with vintage kind of started from there it's like instead of having reproduction levi's like get real vintage levi's you know like instead of buying like the supreme t-shirt where they like uh, like copy the graphic from some other thing like find the original reference to that you know um and like, uh, it all was just kind of like this, uh, like search for like authenticity or something, or like trying to have like, you know, really well-made cool stuff. But like, also it's like, it's all a part of a bigger process of just like learning about culture and uh, like influence and like where things come from. Like this stuff, uh, the same kind of things get, the same good ideas get reused over and over uh, from like decade to decade and, um, like once you get into vintage, it's like you start, you start seeking the origin of all that stuff. Um, it's kind of like you're finding like the like the truth in all this whole world of clothing. You know, <clears throat> it's like it's always shocking how much like creative and cool stuff was done so much like farther before you think it was. It's like I mean, if you like, you can see stuff from like the 20s and 30s, and it's like the craziest patterns, the craziest cuts, like the most creative stuff, uh, and then. It's like you you don't realize like the origin of a lot of stuff, you know? It's like you don't realize that like so much creative cool stuff has been done so far in the past. And a lot of that is just because like you know, clothing doesn't survive that long for most people and uh it's like things kind of get lost. Um but yeah, no, so I got into the average customer doesn't look for that stuff. They just go to the, the average yeah, and they see something totally. and they're like this looks cool, I'm going to wear it, but like you're saying, the reference on that could be from like a 1930s piece that the yeah. designer found and wanted to remake. And it's being in vintage. That's one of, in my opinion, one of the coolest things. Like we get to go to the mall if if you ever want to and look at all this shit and be like, I yeah. know where that's from. I know where that's from. I know where that's from. I get the references yeah. on that on everything for sure, for sure. And it could be a thing that was like, you know, like the original thing was referenced, and then that was referenced, and then that was referenced, like down this whole long path that led it to. uh being at your local mall. Um, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, I, you know, it's like the clothing that we wear is like, it's mostly all just different variations of the same things. So it's like everybody basically wears like, you know, jeans and sneakers and a t-shirt and sweatshirts. And it's like, uh, you know, there's like a million different variations on the same kind of things. Uh, and when you, you know, break it but, down, the modern, the modern uniform is basically athletic or spawned from some functionality yeah. in the past, you know, yeah. or like, so like our jeans were made for miners originally, right? Or yeah. the sweatshirt I'm wearing was originally created for like a football player. The t-shirt was a right. for the army. It all started right, right. from functionality that we take for right. granted, you know? Right. Yeah. No, I know. And uh, yeah, the, I mean, the, obviously the biggest push in the last like 10 or 20 years has been just like, uh, like all athletic, um, all like the most like, you know, like uh, comfortable kind of like, uh, like least, um, like least dressy of all possible things, you know? So like I feel like there's people that like, uh, like wearing jeans is like, a, uh, you know, that's like a special, like going out like item, you know? Cause usually they're just, they're just wearing like, you know, like fucking greasy sweatpants or something that they fucking like sit on their couch in, you know? And it's like, uh, it's like not, it's like most people never, uh, get beyond those clothes in their like, uh, day to day or like weekly, uh, life, you know? Yeah. Um, totally. It's like basically everyone is just like uh, different. It's just there's different levels of like gym clothes and that's their entire uh, outfit. So what was your um, first pair of Levi's that you found that got you got you hooked? Oh, man. Uh, 
I don't know. I mean, like, you know, I had lots of pairs of, of LVC Levi's and then, uh, like, casually started, uh, like, thrifting and I found stuff. I never had a really, really cool pair of Levi's until um, uh, this one day. Uh, I was already well into, like, uh, the world of vintage and, like, and reselling stuff. Um, when I was, like, early on in vintage, like, I didn't... Uh, I didn't really like save like special stuff for myself. I didn't have this like collection of like expensive shit or anything like that. So every cool thing that I got, like I would sell. Um, and like, uh, you know, so this one day I was at, I was at an estate sale with my friend Luke, um, who is like one of the most important people to me in, uh, like my vintage career. Uh, he's a very good friend. Uh, his, uh, Instagram is, um, afterlife boutique. Um, and, uh, we were at this estate sale and, um, it already like started off good. Cause there was like a dumpster in the front yard and like we jumped in this dumpster and pulled like thousands of dollars worth of cool clothes out of this dumpster, um, before like anything even went down. Um, and so like this sale starts and, uh, we're maybe like seven and eight in line or something. Um, and like. Like we're going and like we like run into the house and we're like all oh, like going around and I go into the backyard and I see this lady, I see this lady grab like some good denim and put it in like her basket right, and uh so I'm like, I'm like oh like if you would want to sell any of that like, I would buy I would buy it right now and she's like I'm I'm not selling anything, uh you know like don't bug me basically. Um, and so then like, I, I, like I, I pulled Luke aside and I was like, dude, like I saw what she got. She got like a really good pair of jeans in there. Um, and so like, we're hunting around at, at the house. It's like this big house with like multiple floors and like a backyard and all this stuff. And so I see her, I catch her in this like, kind of like, uh, like isolated room and she's going through her stuff and she pulls these jeans out and I'm like, I'm like just in the off chance that like you would sell these, like what's like a crazy price you would sell these for right now. And, uh, and she was like a thousand bucks and I was like, okay, I'll buy them right now. So I paid a thousand bucks to get these jeans and she gave them to me. We're still within the estate sale. So they haven't even been purchased from the front door yet. Uh, and so I got the jeans that we had to buy them. We had, we, I paid a thousand bucks for the jeans to get them in my hand. And then I bought them for three bucks when I was checking out at the estate. Imagine sale. if you oh. had them and they were like, oh, actually these weren't supposed to be in the sale. And you just gave some random <laughs> thousand bucks and they didn't even let you. It could have happened. It could have happened. It could have happened. I'm sh I'm sure that's happened before. Um, but yeah, and so uh, we got them and we got out of the sale and uh, we like drove down the street and like pulled them out and fucking, you know, it's like these like super dark World War II Levi's, uh, like totally a like, beautiful pair of jeans. We're like looking at them, jumping up, like high-fiving each other and stuff. And like, because this is the first like, first really good pair of jeans i've ever had um and like so uh yeah we owned them together uh and eventually like we uh like sold them together we sold them for uh maybe seven or eight thousand dollars um which like seemed like pretty crazy to me at the time i would obviously buy them back for that much now like not even a question um but yeah it was really fun so that like uh the world war ii levi's that we got at that estate sale was my first ever like really really good pair of jeans and that was the thing that got me started on thinking like oh like i can actually just be actively like trying to buy and sell levi's and make money doing this because i already have like a little bit of the background knowledge um and so i started hunting jeans and i started selling jeans and i started collecting jeans and uh you know because this is also during a time when i was mostly wearing 90s stuff um and you know lots of stussy uh you know, and like, Stop, um, Fuck. you know, and then like slowly my older, uh, like interest in the old jeans kind of like snuck back in and I started like, uh, Hell yo. Yo, like yo. wearing them more. And it's like one day, one day I would wear like true vintage outfit. The next day I would wear 90s stuff. Uh, and it kind of, this was a point in my life where like my style kind of expanded into like, uh, like everything, just be open to everything. Like any era, any, any time, any type of item, you can either combine it all together. You can do like an authentic look that's like totally built uh, from items from the past, from like one specific era, um, you know? And I just like, uh, yeah, dude, the Levi's, 
to the Levi's kind of started it all with all that. Um, that's awesome. And uh, so tra- ever since then, I've been hunting, hunting and yeah, selling and hoarding and uh, just fucking t- taking over my life, taking over my mind. I think about Levi's all the time. <laughs> you know, you know how it is. Everyone knows how it is. So the Levi's World War II version, from what I know, is uh, painted on archuit, right? Yeah, the p- painted archuit. Uh, there was like wartime rationing uh, of goods. So the government told people what. Uh, they told the companies what they could use and they limited how much, how they limited the amount of materials that could be used in making any like individual pair of jeans. Um, so basically the World War II Levi's, like they couldn't put thread on the back pockets. So people had to paint the arcuates on. Um, they couldn't put as many rivets on the jeans. Uh, the actual model number is the S501 uh, XX, which means like a simplified 501. Um, but aside from all that, uh, you know, obviously clothing made during World War II has like a very special, uh, feeling to it, um, because it's like part of this very important moment in American history. And, uh, you know, every pair of World War II Levi's feels like something special. It feels much more handmade than the jeans that were made before it and then the jeans that were made after it. Um, you know, there's stuff with like crazy, like wonky stitching, there's like, you know, there's uh, the World War II 501s. There's like some have uh, like, you know, chambray denim in the pockets. Some have flannel in the pockets. Some have army material in the pockets. Um, they all just kind of have like a special feeling to them. Uh, like when you hold them in person, it's like you're 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 holding a thing that feels more special than all the other uh, Levi's jeans, basically. And that's why it's like the most legendary uh, thing in vintage clothing, you know? It's like when you when you first learn about vintage, it's like that's one of the first things that people teach you is like these like legendary uh, rare Levi's, you know, from this very special uh, point in time. Yeah, that's awesome, yeah. man. It's true. Yeah. Levi's is kind of what started it all. And there's so many variations. And the knowledge about Levi's, it's it's kind of a constant learning. Like you probably know a lot more. Than it's you. definitely constant learning. But you always yeah. learn something new, right? Like you see something. I do. Variations, I do. stitching and whatever. Yeah, uh, and you definitely, like, when you have the stuff in your hand, like, you you learn. Like, you look at all the little details and, like, um, you piece the story together in your head, you know? It's like, you like, oh, I've seen this, I've seen this, I've seen this. Maybe this is, like, the timeline of how this stuff all happened. Um, I know a lot about Levi's, uh, but I'm definitely not an expert. There's tons of people that know more than me. Uh, I got into a discussion about a pair of Levi's yesterday where, like, this kid who's been selling vintage for less than a year made a post and I tried to correct him about something and he totally fucking got me and he was totally right about the whole thing. He like had pieced together the timeline of these two different pairs of Levi's and he had it like totally right and he proved it to me and like I like right away admitted like you totally got this and like I was wrong and I learned like I learned a whole lot about uh, these things that are important to me that I didn't even know. You know that I already had taken for granted that like I basically knew the whole story. Um so you know there's a lot more knowledge out there uh every single day people are learning more every single day there's like a collective um knowledge about uh there's like a collective knowledge that is growing and uh you know like people like everyone is kind of learning together like you learn on your own but everyone is kind of learning together too and uh you should always be looking for people that know more than you and be willing to learn from them yeah, great point. Great point. Yeah, yeah. That's super. That's super cool. That kind of touching on this kid, right? It's like the way humans evolve in general, but also in like yeah. in society. It's like people get to come into business, take what has been already been learned. They learn it quick, yeah. and then they get to take their <clears throat> knowledge to the next level because they've already got this free base of where we were. That's like how science gets so far because you're like. A new scientist gets to like read the books and he knows how well all the previous scientists did. Now he gets to do some new yeah. shit, right? It's like that's how it works yeah. with all the knowledge of vintage too, because you know, this stuff only really started being studied for the most part, like in the nineties, really. Like when the, the yeah. Japan boom happened. It wasn't like like Levi's knows less than like a lot of Jap like way less than a lot of Japanese collectors would who have way less. crazier collectors. Way less. Because they Wait. they never thought about it. They're too busy trying to make money and do whatever else they're doing. And they also have the passion. Like they also like this is the thing to them 
that drives them and the thing that interests them the most. People that work at Levi's for the most part, like this is their job, you know? And so the feeling of like doing this uh, as like your true motivation and like your passion is totally different from the feeling of like, this is my job and like, this is what I have to do uh, for my career, you know? And that's why that's why the private collectors know so much more. Uh, yeah. You know, it's just, uh, it's, it's like a, yeah, it's all about passion. And a lot of people aren't really documenting any of it. They have knowledge lives with them. The knowledge lives in their head. Yeah, 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 you for really sure. You have to like know these people and you also have to like, Sam, like you just said, you have to see it because you could read all the books. You can look at all the tags, but until you like have a bunch of the different era pairs in your hand, you're touching them, you're feeling them, you know, yeah. after enough Levi's um, experience, you could like see a piece of blue denim from like across the fucking flea market. And you know that that's like of an era or like at least old enough to have interest because you've seen it and you have to like, oh yeah, get in that for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's not free knowledge. It's take time. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So I want to jump into Festivus here. You were one of the bidders on the oh, yeah. Miss jeans in the auction. Yeah. You, um, you actually probably broke like a price barrier that was kind of stuck on for a little while in the auction. That, yeah. And uh, it got it to the high place that it went to, you know, yeah. First of all, tell us about the experience you had at Festivus. You know, if anybody wants to go watch the doc, we, we posted that on YouTube. You can check it out. But also about that that auction and how, like, how that felt for you. Uh, I mean, the auction is, like, kind of bittersweet, obviously. Like, I wanted the jeans, uh, like, but I didn't get them. Um, I mean, that was kind of, like, uh, part of the motivation of going there was, like, to try to bid on those jeans. But, uh, you know, I've also been told since then that, like, the actual like market price of those jeans was like less than what they sold for. And like, I had s someone told me like, Oh, like you should be glad you didn't get them because you know, the actual price was more than they're worth. But to me, it was like a really special pair. And like being a part of that whole experience was great. Um, Festivus altogether was like, was really fun. Uh, it basically just felt like, like summer camp for vintage nerds. Um, you know, and like, uh, it was it was like yeah it was like camping at like Rose Bowl or something you know um, yeah. but it was a really good experience obviously it was like it was basically only dealers selling to other dealers um, but I got to meet a lot of people that I had like previously only known through Instagram or whatever uh, and it was great you know it was like it was a cool experience I drove from California out there um, uh, I like uh, I stayed in a little uh, RV with uh, with Jameson uh, elsewhere vintage uh, who was a great guy. Um, yeah, I got to meet a lot of cool people. Uh, obviously, like, Brit is uh, a legend. Um, he's, like, totally insane. But, uh, like, you know, he's, like, undeniably, like, one of the most interesting people in vintage. Um, for sure. For sure. Yeah, uh, he really put together, like, a great thing. Uh, yeah, it was, like, uh, I never really leave. Like, I, like, I always just stay, I always just stay around home. Um, I do my same thing every day and every week, but, like, uh, I don't even go down to Rose Bowl anymore because uh, I hate driving. Um, but, like, uh, that experience was definitely special enough to get me uh, out of my comfort zone and to go and do that. Uh, it was so much fun. It was great seeing everybody. It was great seeing you. Uh, you know, uh, it was it was, it was was also just, like, really weird, like, being, like, in this, like, uh, like, like, river resort, like, with, like, 150 vintage dealers. Like, it was such a weird... Uh, experience but it was cool it was great i bought a lot of cool shit i bought a lot of stuff i shouldn't have bought um like i you know uh it was fun it was super fun yeah yeah totally, <laughs> totally. I, it was unexpected it definitely gave me a new appreciation for brit like yeah yeah we knew he was an interesting guy before that but i never spent enough time with him to like appreciate the true level of craziness in in the good yeah. way like we're saying like it's like he's, he's crazy He's got so much energy and it's like it was contagious and yeah, it was it was super fun. Totally. Yeah. And and that auction that auction to kind of end it was like it kind of just was like the icing on the cake because you're like, that was uh it was it was like heated, man. I could tell like watching you in that seat bidding, you're like, you know, that's like a big ticket. You had you bid it up to like sixty five grand or something. Sixty five thousand, which yeah. Uh you know, yeah, it was cool, dude. I wanted the jeans. It was really fun. It was like it was fun doing it. Uh, I never, uh, I never bid on anything in an auction before, other than like uh, eBay or whatever. Um, 
But also, like, uh, can you describe like your physical feeling in the chair bidding sixty five thousand dollars? My physical feeling uh, in the chair was like I had been waiting for hours for this auction to start and I was like bored and tired. Like, I, you know, like I heard like all these speeches and I'm like, fuck, like, dude, <laughs> get on with the jeans, dude. Um, so by the time it by the time it all was over, it was just kind of like uh, like this bittersweet thing. Like, uh, but it was cool being a part of it, dude. It was fun. Like, uh, it definitely felt like a big rush, like, uh, you know, shooting my shot. And uh, there was also this super weird experience of like every single person in the room like shouting like bad boy at me um and like uh trying to like get me like amped up uh which i've never really had every single person in a room all like stop and stare and look at me all at once uh which was very awkward um but it was fun dude it was so much fun similar to the peer pressure of like doing drugs in high school major peer pressure (laughs) everyone peer pressured me into bidding on these jeans yeah (laughs) oh fuck that's awesome Yeah, I got, I got uh, one more topic I want to discuss. Then we're going to run into, like, my quick fire ender questions. Um, okay. But the last topic I want to talk about is your new store, dude. You have, you opened a new store with a friend of yours. I was... Work, yeah. Right? Uh, my friend my friend Kristen and I opened a new store in North Beach, San Francisco. It's called Work. Uh, our sister store, her store, is called Vacation. Um, uh, work.vintage is the Instagram. Yeah, we'll put that uh, on the screen for everybody. Yeah. Uh, we have the coolest selection of vintage in the Bay Area. Um, totally eclectic mix. There's really cool stuff. There's really rare stuff. It's not just mainstream Bay Area vintage. Um, you know, uh, it, it's really cool. It's a small shop. It feels special. Uh, I hope everybody can, like, give us a follow and come to the store if you're in town. Um, North Beach is, like, the most charming and cool part of San Francisco with amazing food. Um, I really... Uh, yeah, I would I would appreciate um like helping us grow the account and grow the business. I've never I've never owned like anything. Um like I always just uh kind of like hustle stuff uh from home or from my showroom and uh it's cool having like a real place, you know, like a real place to go to. Um and uh it's awesome. Uh I would really like to thank uh my business partner Kristen. She uh you know, she put a lot of effort and everything into making it the amazing place that it is. Um, so you have kind of this new model where it's like a marketplace of sorts where you have, uh, you have vendors that supply, right? Yeah, we have vendors. Um, uh, there's 10 different vendors total, including me and Kristen. Um, some are local, some, uh, are from, uh, across the country. Uh, yeah, my friend Nils, uh, miles to go vintage. He's in there. Um, my friend Nate, Nate's dry goods, uh, on Instagram is in there. Uh, my, my other very good friend and mentor, David, um, goodbye heart vintage is in there. Um, he's one of the people, uh, yeah, he's one of the people that's taught me, uh, more in vintage, uh, than anybody else except for Luke. Um, uh, yeah, it's a really cool place and, um, you know, it's gotten off, uh, we, we opened in like the coldest week of the year and then like, then the next three weeks has been like torrential rain and flooding, um, but things are going good, and uh, you know it's all just gonna get better from here. Uh, my phone is at like ten percent battery, by the way. Um, okay, well, we're we're gonna we're gonna fit, wrap it up. I got one more question okay. about the shop, and then we'll get into the okay. vendors. But okay, the, um, so if you so obviously opening a shop is a whole new experience for you. It's it's a big undertaking, yeah. a lot of commitment. You know, if somebody's yeah. open the shop, you gotta you gotta take on rents, you gotta take on potentially labor overhead, insurances. Fuck, the, the list is never ending, right? Yeah. So. If you were to give anybody advice, like about your experience on opening a shop, like what do you got? <laughs> I don't know. Just uh, be prepared for it to take over uh, everything. Um, but like, you know, it's worth it to put in the work because it's like it's something to have uh, for the future and to like, you know, like potentially like have this thing forever that is like. Uh, a new like outlet to sell and to make money and like it can be like a really special place you know um i don't know i don't have any good advice about it uh, it's really hard to do um yeah okay cool i don't have any good advice uh congrats yeah. to you on, on that venture, <laughs> thank you dude that's super rad yeah, excited you. to check it out next time i'm in town for sure yeah thank you uh, okay we're gonna get into a few questions here i stole okay. a segment from my favorite snowboard podcast called the bomb hole and i adapted it for vintage Okay. So, 
got a group of questions. The first question is, who is your vintage goat? Who do you look up to as like the killer, the the, um, the most the most influential person in vintage, male and I want a female. Oh man, uh, this could be just to you I, personally, I, whatever. Yeah, I, I I don't know about vintage overall. Um, I definitely look up to my friend Luke, uh, Afterlife Boutique. Uh, um, he uh has the most knowledge of anybody, and uh, like, you know. Uh, I learned I learned a lot from him. He's uh, yeah. Uh, to me, he's he's the he's the greatest uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I would also uh, you know, for for a woman pick, I would like to uh, mention Karen from Mercy Vintage in Oakland because um, she uh, is really really good at uh, at business and has helped me. Whenever I talk to her, I get excited about like business and learning how to do things in like a like adult way, and like I really look up to her uh, for making responsible like business decisions. Um, yeah, she's one of the few people I have that like every like uh, I feel like I can come to her with a problem and she like has already dealt with it and knows exactly what to do. Um, yeah, that's what awesome. I <laughs> Yeah, I uh, love it. Okay, cool. You need some of those people in your life because the uh, For sure when you're making your decisions, always based on on gut emotion, based on a pair of Levi's. You know, maybe not the best. <laughs> I know, not the best business decision. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so who is who do you think is the most underrated, aka like say rookie of the year? Oh man, I don't even know. Um, or do you know anybody you uh, want to put put some shine on? Like any homies you got that are like killing it that you're like they deserve a little bit of shine right now. Uh, I have a homie that's killing it. Uh, he is like uh, major competition out here. Uh, that would be Ivan Raghound Vintage. Um, he uh, is always at the same events as me and does better than me and gets cooler shit. And uh, I definitely I look up to him and I'm jealous of him. Um, Ivan is great. Uh, once again, I would like to shout out Nate from Nate's Dry Goods. Uh, he's amazing uh, at Vintage. He's like the uh, estate sale like dominator. Um, Taylor Life Grime. Uh, he's like like the weirdest guy, uh, but very charming and very cool, and everybody loves him. Um, I would like to also uh, I'd like to shout out uh, Kristen Vacation SF. Uh, she's my business partner, and um, she also is very good at Vintage. She has the best connections of anybody locally, um, gets um, gets better stuff than me and gets it for a better deal, which obviously makes me very jealous too. Um, oh, I, I would also like to shout out uh, Idaho Jeans too. Jordan, he's the nicest guy and super knowledgeable. Um, I don't know, I think that's it. Oh, uh, I don't know. Also maybe uh, Amazon Men's Room, Sean. Uh, he's like- Hell yeah, yeah. shout out Sean. I feel, yeah, he's the yeah the yeah the OG chonker. Uh, I don't know if he's like super excited about vintage anymore, but I've never seen anyone as good at like like at the flea market or whatever. Like he's the fucking the best who's ever done it. Um, yeah, he's also hilarious. Uh, obviously, if you know him, he is hilarious. Yeah, we, we talk uh, all the time. I miss seeing him in person, but uh, yeah. Soon enough, I'm gonna go out and visit him. Nice. You should. You gonna go snowboarding and stuff? Yeah, dude. Right. He's living the life out there. Yeah, this is, that must be yeah. It's like the uh, the dream. <laughs> Here, and we got the next question coming in is: What is your most prized piece of vintage in your collection? If you could think of one piece you're up, you own right now, what is it? Uh, my favorite thing is uh this this is actually the uh from a, another like long like estate sale story. Um, but I have this jacket. It's like an old uh like 1930s like uh merchant marine or like army Mackinac jacket. I forget what it's even called. Um, but basically, uh, we went to this estate sale, me and my friend Luke. And, uh, after the sale, we figured out, um, that this jacket was belonged to this, uh, this guy, this Japanese American guy. And it was his jacket that he wore in, uh, the internment camps. Um, and then he went on to be in like the 442nd and like a decorated soldier and all this stuff. Um, but like, I have this jacket that was like the government issued like jacket that they like gave to people like in the Japanese internment camps, which is obviously like a very like sad thing. Uh, but like, it's cool to have this piece of history um, that like feels like really special to have that like we got from this guy's estate. And um, the like process of like this whole day long adventure to get it and then finding out its importance afterward 
has kind of like cemented it for me as like the most uh as like my most special and favorite thing that i own um, That's awesome. it's like it's all it's like a super cool thing on its own but like the the like my uh experience of getting it and like learning about it uh makes it my favorite thing yeah nice. <laughs> okay next question okay. what is the worst trend right now in vintage oh man uh I don't know. Um, I'm not going to answer this because, uh, like, whatever the trends are, whatever the trends are in vintage, like, I would just like to say that we all spend time, like, picking the things we like and picking the things we don't like and differentiating di differentiating ourselves, you know, picking people that, like, I'm like them or I'm not like them. Um, and I would just like to say that no matter, like, who you are or what you're into or, like, whatever trend you're into that I'm not into – or whatever trend I'm into that you're not into, at the end of the day, like every single person in vintage, uh, whether you're like a dealer or like, or a customer or whatever, like all of us as a community and as a group have so much more in common uh, with each other that like we're so much more alike than we are different that I don't even want to pick out things to differentiate each other. Cause like we are really a great community and it's like a really special thing. And like, whatever our differences are like we actually have so much more in common that we should like uh like come together over look at this guy being, being <laughs> inclusive lover of the community nice i tried nice. i tried okay so the last one on the list today is what is your favorite cut of jeans 501 oh 505 or are you a flare boot cut man with the 517 if you answer anything other than 501, you're wrong. Um, 501 is the, the greatest, the greatest, uh, greatest pair of jeans ever made. There is no question about it. Uh, it's the like the longest lasting, the most infamous. Uh, nothing can ever touch it. It will forever be the greatest pair of jeans ever made and the greatest piece of clothing ever made. And that's final. Um, I saw you uh, <laughs> the other day on your Instagram wearing a safari jean. Is that what oh, called? the bush jeans, the bush jeans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love those. Yeah, those yeah, are yeah. cool. Those are uh, very I, interesting. I wear the I, I wear the straight leg version. Uh, I can't wear flares. It's just uh, doesn't feel right to me. Um, but you know, everyone should do what they like. Uh, yeah, and... totally. Okay, Sam. Thanks for coming on the show, dude. I just want to give you the opportunity to give some shout outs. Last minute shout outs. Uh, I'm done with all my shout outs. Uh, I just have one last uh, shout out. That would be to uh, Ashley, uh, the love of my life and my partner and the mother of all my cats um uh i love her and i would uh just like to give her a shout out and a thank you right. everyone else important has been mentioned and if i forgot you i'm really sorry uh i have a t terrible memory uh everyone i appreciate everyone that i talk to on a regular basis i appreciate everyone who uh ever buys stuff from me um, I appreciate everyone that even just messages me about any random thing I post or likes my stuff or, uh, anyone, uh, that I have like, uh, contact with in, in this business, you know, it's like this business is, it pays my bills, but it also is like my main, uh, like this is the, the main way that I'm social. It's the main way that I express myself and who I am, um, and I appreciate everybody who's ever been a part of that in any way. That's it. <laughs> awesome, dude. Thank you again. That was a great, uh, great chat and uh, stoked to have you on. All right. We'll Thank see you soon. Okay. All right. Thank you. And that is a wrap for episode one of 2023 with known bad boy, my boy, Sam. Okay. Thank you guys for tuning in. Episodes dropping weekly from now on. This has been brought to you by Bidstitch and Easy. If you guys want to go live, sell your product, go download the Easy app, E-Z-Z-E. -Z -Z -E. Tune in, stream live on the app. And, uh, you know, my store, my warehouse, F is in Frank, right here. If you guys want to shop the warehouse selection on F is in Frank, vintage.com, use code VT, uh, VTGN stuff. Put that on the screen. And be well, be happy, not crappy, in the words of my father, Dave Heifetz. See you guys on the next one. Peace.